Department of Energy and or its regulators. This is a little different. This is an Oregon meeting. We felt that there was a great need on this topic to engage with our citizens, to talk with you about what this is, to bring some people in to answer some of the questions, and that's what we hope to do tonight. So let me give you a really very brief uh, explanation of the topic tonight. And this is a very, very simple version. So the U.S. Department of Energy, which most of us will refer to as DOE, uh, DOE and its contractors have removed most of the high-level radioactive waste from 16 underground tanks at the Sea Tank Farm in Hanford. High-level waste has to go to deep geologic disposal for its final destination, so deep geologic disposal. The Department of Energy was unable to retrieve all the waste from the tanks, and it's a not insignificant amount. So they are looking to classify the remaining waste not as high-level waste, but as low-level waste. And on the surface, that might sound a little bit outrageous when you hear it, but frankly, there does need to be a process by which the Department of Energy can do that, at least for some of the waste, because there is no way they're ever going to get every last drop of what we consider high-level waste in hand. So the devil is in the details. So we're going to get into a lot of the details tonight and hopefully explain this for you so you can, can understand this a little bit. So let me explain the, the format tonight that we're going to do. Again, this is an Oregon-sponsored meeting, so we've set the agenda. Uh, we did the invitations, we did the promotion with a lot of help from some of the citizen groups and others. Uh, we're going to have a just one PowerPoint. Uh, my colleague Jeff Burright with the Oregon Department of Energy is going to do a, a PowerPoint presentation about this issue. And Jeff led our review on this document the Department of Energy is asking for comments on. Uh, he is the principal author of the comments that we have already submitted to the Department of Energy. And there are copies out there if you did not get a, a copy. There's a four-page version with our letter and a 12-page version which includes eight pages of technical comments. We intentionally wanted to issue our comments before this public meeting because we wanted to be able to hand you a piece of paper that gives our formal thoughts on this issue. And hopefully it's something you can look at a little bit tonight, you can take it home and study it if you will, and figure out whether or not it's something that you should be alarmed with or want to make comments on uh, as we get into that. In explaining what the meeting is tonight, it's also important I explain what this meeting is not. So this is not a public hearing. Uh, we are not recording your comments. We're not going to be submitting official comments to the Department of Energy. The Department of Energy is here and will participate in our meeting tonight. They're also not here to receive or record uh, formal comments. There is a box out in the lobby that you can provide written comments for. There's also some information out in the lobby uh, in terms of whether or not you want to provide comments in another manner uh, before the comment deadline closes November 7th. And it's important for you to understand as well, we have submitted comments, but if we hear something tonight, if we hear some compelling arguments that we did not include, we are more than happy to submit additional comments on behalf of the citizens of Oregon for that. So we have one PowerPoint. Jeff promises it will be less than 20 minutes, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Less than 20 minutes. Uh, we're then going to have a panel to address some questions. So in the past few weeks, we developed some questions that we thought were really pertinent and got to the, to the, really to the meat of this issue. And we shared those questions with the Department of Energy, with the Washington Department of Ecology, with several citizen groups, and some other people that, that really follow Hanford. And we said, are these the right questions? Um, and they gave us some input. We tweaked them a little bit. We have 11 questions now, and those copies of those are out there as well, so you can follow along. So we'll do the presentation. We're going to have a panel that will involve the U.S. Department of Energy, the Washington Department of Ecology, and Jeff to address those 11 questions. And hopefully that will answer some of the things that maybe is stirring in your minds on this issue. Then we're going to open it up, see what you have to say, hear your comments, hear your questions, hear your statements, whatever, whatever you'd like to do. And we'll figure out 
who all wants to talk and how long it might work for each of you to talk as, as we go along. So that's the plan in terms of the format. Um, I would ask uh, if you can hold your comments until we do get through those first two parts, uh, because I think it will address a lot of the questions you have, and then we're going to have a lot of time to, to get into things. Before we get to Jeff, I want to share with you three principles that my agency shared with the Department of Energy on a past Hanford cleanup issue. Uh, they're short, I want to read them, but I think they're very pertinent tonight. So first, long-term risk to public health and safety in the environment simply cannot be accepted. No action should ever reach that standard. Second, if the options presented do not give us the greatest confidence that standard can be achieved, we urge you to pursue more innovative technologies to gain that confidence. And third, waste which can be safely retrieved and reliably disposed should be acted upon now. Those were comments delivered by the director of the Oregon Department of Energy to U.S. Department of Energy at a meeting in Portland, July 10th, 1986. 32 years ago, wow. it was the first opportunity that Oregon and the public had to comment on what was then shaping up as plans for the cleanup of the Hanford site. When the agency <laughs> submitted those written comments a few weeks later, they added a fourth principle. We should not take irreversible actions until we have great confidence in those actions. So I think four pertinent points from 32 years ago that are very pertinent tonight in terms of the discussion we're going to have. So that's the plan. Sound good? Okay. We're going to turn it over to Jeff, and uh, then we'll go through the questions. And there we go. You want this? You want the podium? I'll do podium, I suppose. All right. Is that all right? Yeah. Can, anyone, can you all hear me? Okay, great. Uh, as Ken said, my name is Jeff Burray. I work at the Oregon Department of Energy. And there we go. Uh, tonight, we are here together to talk about a decision that has implications for long-term risk. Uh, my job in the next 15 or 20 minutes is to lay out all the pieces so that you all can put them together yourselves and, and be informed as we get into the panel. This is the question before us in a nutshell. Can we take the residual waste in the 16 tanks at Sea Farm and can, must we classify them as high level waste, such as the picture on the left? And if it's high level waste, by law, it is required to be disposed in a deep <coughs> geologic repository. That does not yet exist in this country. Uh, the closest we have come has been the plans for Yucca Mountain that are currently going. Uh, however, if the waste can be classified as low-level waste, that opens the door to allow on-site disposal of that waste, assuming that you can meet your standards of protection. Uh, so the decision that's being made is not a closure decision. It is a waste classification decision. So you could classify your waste as low-level waste and still not necessarily be able to close it on-site. <coughs> But if you don't classify it, you have to put it in a geologic repository. And just as a note, the figure on the right, which includes grouted tanks and then a cap over the top, is a conceptual diagram of what a closure at a sea farm might look like. But the details have still not been fully designed. I just need to caveat that. All right, let's zoom out and then work our way back in. So the Henford site is about, I think it's about 90 miles up the river. Uh, it's 30 miles north of the Oregon border, <coughs> right on the river. And you can see in blue, there's a central plateau. That plateau is about 250 to 300 feet above an aquifer that flows toward the southeast and eventually connects with the Columbia River. And the tank farms are on that plateau. And I think that's about seven miles is the distance from the plateau. <coughs> the zoom is in a little bit further. You can see the, the central plateau is broken into two halves, 200 west and 200 east. And the sea tank farm that we're talking about tonight is there, so red. Hmm. 
This is a picture of one of the 500,000 gallon tanks. There are 12 of these in C Farm, and then there are four smaller tanks. I just wanted you to get a sense of scale here. You can see the people on the top. Wow. These tanks were built of concrete with a carbon steel liner. And these tanks were built in about 1943, 1944 time frame. Hmm. Here's a view from inside one of the tanks. Again, just to give you a sense of scale. These tanks were buried in clusters of farms, and they were buried about eight feet under, well, under about eight feet of soil to provide radiation protection. So the bottom of the tanks are about 40 feet below ground, <coughs> as it currently sits today. This decision also includes about seven miles of pipelines that connected the various tanks and also connected these tanks to other parts of the site where they were receiving waste and sending waste around. Uh, these, I believe when these pipelines were taken out of service, they were flushed. However, there are some pipelines that have been plugged with waste. They're, it's all part of it. So now I want to talk about the definition of high level waste and what waste classification is and specifically about this process the DOE is undertaking right now, which is called Waste Incidental to Reprocessing, or WEIR is what we're going to be calling it. So to start off, I want to tell the story of the waste in the tanks a little bit. The picture you're looking at is from inside one of the tanks, high-level waste. In order to really understand the waste, first I have to describe how you make weapons-grade plutonium. So you take uranium and you put it in an aluminum can, for lack of a better term, and you take thousands of these and you put them in a graphite reactor and you leave them to bake for a certain amount of time. And neutrons are pinging around and some of the uranium will fission, it will split it into two, and when it splits it becomes very highly radioactive. And some of the uranium will absorb a neutron, get a little bit heavier, and become plutonium man-made element that was the fuel for nuclear weapons. For every ton of uranium that they processed this way, they would get out about a pound and a half of plutonium that was wow. trapped in this uranium. How do you get that out? Well, you have to dissolve the uranium. First, they would dip it in a caustic to get rid of the aluminum shell, and then they would dip it into an acid, nitric acid, to totally dissolve the uranium and all the fission products and make just a really nasty soup. And then they would add solvents to make the plutonium drop out so they could extract it. Now you have this highly radioactive, highly acidic soup, and you have to put it somewhere. And they have these carbon steel tanks, and carbon steel likes to rust or corrode. And so they had to also add neutralizing agents. Sodium hydroxide was one of the primary ones to take it from an acid to a very high base. And then over time, the liquid in these tanks began to evaporate. Water then would evaporate, so it's kind of like a roux. And now you have this very thick, uh, thick mixture of tank waste. They did other various processes over time. And as you can see, there's a lot going on in this waste. And this is what we're talking about when we talk about high-level waste. High-level waste also has a legal definition. DOE has the authority to manage its own nuclear waste. It is its own regulator under the Atomic Energy Act. However, the definition of high-level waste comes from Congress, and it comes from the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982. And so DOE has to work with this definition that's been given to them when they're managing waste. And there are some key parts of this definition that I want to point out to you. First off, I mean, it's highly radioactive material. <coughs> highly radioactive is not strictly defined. Resulting from the reprocessing spent nuclear fuel speaks to the origin of the waste. So where the waste comes from is an essential part of the definition that Congress gave. But then as you go through, it also talks about this idea of it has to, the solid waste, or excuse me, Solid material derived from liquid waste has to contain fission products in sufficient concentrations. Well, sufficient concentrations isn't really defined either. And it's because of these ambiguities in the law that DOE has 
added this extra process called waste incidental reprocessing. And this is generally how it works. Over the years, there's been a concept that's emerged to say, let's not think about just the origin of the waste alone as making this kind of waste. Let's also think about the risk that this waste would represent in the environment. So if you take a sample from a tank, say this high level waste, originally, if it resulted from the reprocessing of spent nuclear fuel and it was highly radioactive, yes, it is high level waste. What this process supposes is if it can meet particular criteria that were developed by DOE and the NRC in the 1990s that would demonstrate that it would not pose an unacceptable risk if it was managed as low level waste. In other words, if it was disposed in a shallow environment, such as at Hanford, if it can meet performance criteria, then the waste incidental to reprocessing process allows you to call it something else, in this case, low level waste. So that's the, the general idea. It has not been without its difficulties and complications. It has a fraught legal process. I'm gonna take you through kind of the key moments in time. So first off, in the 90s, DOE and NRC generated the three weird criteria, which I'll go through in a minute. Uh, and in order to implement those criteria, DOE issued Order 435.1, which is their own regulation for how they manage themselves, and it included this weird process in it. Then they got sued by the Natural Resource Defense Council. Uh, Oregon joined in on that litigation for reasons that we described in our letter. Um, challenging DOE's authority to reclassify high-level waste the way that they did. There was a judicial ruling in 2003 in favor of NRDC and others saying that no, DOE did not have this authority. A year later, that ruling was voided by an appeals judge who said that the issue was not yet ripe for judicial review. The idea there is you can't sue someone just for putting out a rule. You've got to wait until they try to use it. So that ended in a stalemate. DOE then went to Congress and said, hey, we need a solution here. Can you give us the authority to make these waste classification decisions to call something other than high level waste? And Congress acted by passing the National Defense Authorization Act 2005, section 3116. I'm just gonna call it 3116, please. Okay. But 3116 also followed basically the same criteria as 435, a couple little differences. One of the main ones is that it includes the NRC and states in the decision. So they have either consultation or there's kind of a conditioning authority that goes involved with that. However, the state of Oregon, the state of Washington, and the state of New York petitioned in Congress to not be a part of th Section 3116. 3116 does not apply at Hanford today. There are various reasons for that. I think some of it involved the process by which it was moved through Congress, some uncertainty about what the potential effects could be. So once they had 3116, DOE started to use it. They started to perform waste and sediment reprocessing determinations at Savannah River in South Carolina to close tank farms, and at Idaho, a national lab to close tank farms. They also do it for, re for separating high level waste from lower activity waste at Savannah River. So you know the waste treatment plant at Hanford that's going to turn the tank waste into glass. Have you heard about the VIT plant? So the VIT plant also needs a process to separate high level waste from lower activity waste. And that's, that happened at Savannah River. Then in about 2012, DOE started floating the balloon of using 435 on some smaller waste sources. First mm -hmm. was some melters from the West Valley Demonstration Project in New York, video <coughs> fires. Um, and then in 2017, just last year, DOE treated three gallons of tank waste from Hanford, grouted them, and then sent them off to Texas for disposal as a proof of concept or an idea they're thinking about. That required a weird determination and mm -hmm. used 435.1 to do it. They weren't sued when they used 435 either of those times. But now they're using 435 to close the tank line at Hanford. So there is an outstanding question whether this is finally the moment of ripeness, where if there's going to be some judicial review, now might be the time. 
Now I want to talk about, so we've gone into the history, we've done general talk about what high level waste is and what they're trying to do. Now I want to go specifically into the three weird criteria that they developed and the way they've applied them to the tank farms at Hanford. So here are the three criteria. Number one, remove key radionuclides to the maximum extent technically and economically practical. How's that for a modifier? Technically and economically practical. And they have a whole segment in their document about how that is judged. Once you've done that, the next step is to demonstrate or to show that you can manage the waste in its disposal environment, so in this case, in a Hanford, it become a low-level waste disposal facility, such that you can meet performance objectives of 10 CFR Part 61. 10 CFR 61 is the NRC's regulations for the licensing wow. of a low-level waste disposal facility, which is, and it's, it's a, in general terms, it's a dose-based standard out to a set number of years. So I'll, I'll get to that uh, when we get to that section. And third, you have to show that the waste you leave behind is not so concentrated that it exceeds Class C criteria, which is another classification system developed by the NRC that said, you know, for, for X number of radionuclides in your waste, it cannot be above some concentration in curies per meter cubed. And there are alternate ways that you can prove that. We'll get into that as well. Uh, and these were the criteria that were codified in 435.1, DOE's own regulation. Talking about the first criteria, uh, removal of key radionuclides. <clears throat> so 16 tanks, DOE spent about 19 years trying to get the waste out of the tanks, and they used a number of technologies to try to get there. The first and most basic one was rinse it with hot water and then siphon that water out and that would get a lot of the soluble waste out. Mm. The second technology that they employed, kind of like being at the dentist, you spray it with a concentrated strip spray of water and then you suck it out. So they had pressure washers essentially on these long articulating arms. Mm. Um, and that's the more aggressive jet spray. They also used a technology called the bulb track, which is like a transformer toy robot that could get through the, the 12 inch wide riser of a tank and then mm. unfold, and it also had its own pressure washers and kind of a bulldozer front so it could push waste toward the center where they're going. So they use these criteria to do bulk retrieval of the waste from the tanks. And as I said, it was 16 tanks in 19 years. Oh. And Sea Farm was the first tank farm in Hanford to undergo retrieval. And it was initially conceived as a proving ground for these technologies, as well as some technology they developed along the way. Here's what it looked like after a, we'll call it a successful retrieval. You can see it's pretty shiny in there. There's some liquid left over from when they were spraying. They eventually evaporated that out using their ventilation system, so this would be dry today. <laughs> Here's a picture of a, a less successful waste retrieval. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but there are just these piles of material, as well as some stubborn stuff all along the edge of the tank. And this is uh, solids larger than grains of sand, according to the Weir evaluation. So anything that was larger, heavier than a grain of sand their pumps weren't strong enough to pull up out of the tank 40 feet to get wow. to the next system. So there are going to be these heavier materials that are left behind. Here's a slightly closer look, I hope you can see it, of what this material looks like in the bottom of the tank, what these leftovers are. You can see it's dry material, largely these larger clods of, of material. An even closer look. Uh, here are some samples that were taken from the tanks after they completed retrieval, and they did assays on this to figure out what was actually in the waste, and they used that to inform the inventory that they did to determine what the actual risk would be from the waste that's left behind. You put it all together and wrap it up, and this is what they accomplished. They were able to retrieve about 1.7 million gallons of waste, and they moved those into double shell tanks on site awaiting the waste treatment plant to be finished so they could turn it into glass. 
There are about 67,000 gallons of waste by volume still in the tanks today. That equates to nearly a half a million curies of radioactivity. A curie is just a measure of radioactivity. Uh, for reference, one curie of cesium-137, which is a common fission product, would be, if it was on your skin, would be lethal in about 20, gosh, is it 20 seconds or 20 minutes? Wow. Seconds. Very short amount of time. <laughs> if it was a foot away, however, it would be a lethal dose in 20 hours. Wow. Now, this is not really a reasonable or likely scenario, so let's instead talk about it in terms of concentrations in water. The drinking water standard for cesium-137 is, I believe, 12 picocuries per liter. A picocurie is one trillionth of one curie. Strontium-90, another common radionuclide, it's eight picocuries per liter. For technetium-99, which is one I'm going to be talking about later, the drinking water standard is 900 picocuries per liter. You want to remember that. <coughs> and overall, DOE estimates they achieved about a 96% retrieval efficiency. And here's what that looked like tank by tank. So you can see there were three that were very difficult. Uh, in the tri-party agreement and in DOE's EIS for tank closure, there was a stated goal of 360 cubic feet left over in the tanks when they were done retrieving, or approximately 99%. So that's that blue line along the bottom. This is the actual, well, our best estimate of what the actual radionuclides are that were left behind. So on the bottom, you can see strontium-90, and its daughter product, yttrium-90, is in the blue over there. That's 86% wow. of the total amount of waste that's left. Cesium-137 and its daughter product, barium-137M, uh, roughly 8%. And then you get into some of the smaller ones. You can see plutonium there, 175 curies, excuse me, and technetium-99. The estimate is that there are about three curies left over. And that's an important one because technetium-99 has a very long half-life and it's very mobile in the environment. It moves basically like water. Mm. And so that's going to be the driver for long-term risk when we get into DOE's models. What do I mean by half-lives, for those of you who are not steeped in all this stuff? So a half-life is the amount of t time it takes for an amount of waste to essentially burn down about half of this radioactivity. I like to think about it like an invisible fire burning down at a predictable rate. So again, strontium-90, of which there was over 80% of the waste, has a half-life about 30 years. There's a rule of thumb that says if you can get to about 10 half-lives, the amount that's left over will be virtually zero. That can break apart when you have very large amounts of waste. But for safety's sake, three to 500 years. Cesium is the same. When you get to something like plutonium, it has a half-life of 24,000 years. Technetium-99, 200,000 years. So these things, when we make decisions about these, they're virtually forever decisions. Wow. These are the residual constituents by mass. So this includes non-radioactive constituents. The number one constituent is aluminum. Hmm. Why aluminum? Well. I think it's because of the aluminum cladding they had around the uranium pellets that they were putting into the reactor. The other top ones include sodium from the sodium hydroxide that neutralized the tanks, phosphate, leftover uranium, hydroxide. So a lot of these were the neutralizing products or the acid, either way, the acid in the base from the tank. This is where strontium, 86% of the radioactivity sits on the spectrum about 115 kilograms across these 16 tanks of the 70,000 gallons. So a lot of radioactivity can come in a pretty small package. So before I move on. So this is what DOE achieved in their retrieval. And in their weir evaluation, they prove or they, they assert <coughs> that they have achieved the maximum extent technically and economically practical of what is left over. And part of that relies on this next piece, which is criteria two, meeting the performance standards of 10 CFR 61. And here's what they look like. The red shows the actual standards numerically that they have to hit. 25 millirems per year. That's a radioactive dose to a body uh, for any member of the public. 
uh, 500 milligrams per year to an inadvertent intruder after institutional controls are removed. To explain that a little bit, DOE has made the assumption that they're going to own the central plateau of Hanford forever. So essentially, they're going to keep the public away from the waste. However, they don't get to take credit for that in their long-term assessments, so they have to assume that those controls on keeping the public out are going to fail after, after 100 years. And between them and the NRC, they set a different standard about what the acute dose to a person could be in that scenario. They also have to achieve various groundwater standards. Uh, and they have to prove it for 1,000 to 10,000 years. We're talking mm -hmm. about very long-term uncertainty and risk management. And these aren't the only criteria they're going to have to satisfy when they get to closure. There are also cleanup criteria that are risk-based under laws like CERCLA and RECRA that they have to also meet. And some of those are more stringent than these. So how do you prove, or how do you demonstrate a reasonable expectation that you've managed this risk for that long of a period of time? Essentially, it comes down to a complicated mathematical representation of a natural environment, or a model. So that model takes a source, radionuclides, and it enacts processes upon them to make those radionuclides move, which the process that makes radionuclides move is water. Water moves waste through the environment. But if that waste never encounters a person, there's not a risk or, or an ecological receptor, an animal, what have you. And so <coughs> this is the, the general framework under which they built a performance assessment, which is also a part of this decision here. It's a 1,600 page document. It's a, it's a beast. Uh, in this performance assessment, DOE had to look at future receptors, future populations of people. Um, they included a future residential uh, user, 100 meters down gradient from the sea farm, so on the site, on the plateau, who grows crops, keeps livestock, and drinks groundwater. And then they looked, like I said, at an intruder after 100 meters who drills a well through the tanks, through pipes, etc., and then can spread those pipe cuttings or the drill cuttings out over. Um, their model extends out to 10,000 years, as I said. They also assume that the protective cap that they want to put over the tanks after they grout them to keep rainwater out, again, water moves waste. They assume that that cap fails after 500 years, but they do some uncertainty analysis in the PA looking at what if it fails sooner than that. I'll get into that in a minute. That's ridiculous. This is what their performance assessment found. <coughs> as I said before, technetium 99 was the primary contributor to risk over long periods of time because it's long-lived and it's mobile. But what they found when they ran their model was that the highest concentration in water is 30 picocuries per meter, 1,500 years from today. Remember, the drinking water standard for technetium 99 is 900 picocuries per meter. They calculated a dose equivalent of 0.1 millirems per year associated with that peak dose. Again, the standard they're trying to hit for their own criteria are 25 milligrams per year. And if you want to put it in the context of 